tell our worship team thank you. Well, good morning. If you are new here, my name is Amber. My husband, Matt, and I are the pastors at City Church, and we're so excited that you're with us. Whether you're online or whether you're here in the building, we just want to say welcome. And this is an opportunity for you, if this is maybe one of your first couple times or your very first time, this is the part of the service where you can connect with us. We're going to put some information up on the screen. If you text any of those words into that phone number on the left, it will send back a link to you to give you a little bit more information. So if you're visiting with us, please text the word guest to that phone number. It'll give you some more information about who we are, kind of what we do around here. But if this is your home church, this is the time where we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. And you can do that by texting the word give. Or you can always drop off, um, as Matt says, if you're um, analog versus digital, you can always drop it off in one of the collection boxes on your way down the hall. But let's just pray over the offering. God, we just thank you, Lord that you have blessed us abundantly. God, we just thank you for all the things that you're doing in our church. We thank you for all the ways that you're moving in our city. And God, we just want to be a part of that with the money that we receive today. And Lord, we just pray your blessing over it. In Jesus' name, amen. So just one quick announcement for you guys. If you have recently graduated high school, first of all, congratulations, because that's awesome. Good for you. Um, but if you're a high school graduate into your 20-somethings, we're going to be having a barbecue slash swim party slash pool party slash good time. So, woo-woo! I know, John's excited. Um, that's going to be next Sunday, and we want to make sure that we buy enough food for you. So please text the word YA party to that same phone number, you'll get a link back and then you can RSVP and let us know how many of you and your friends are coming because invite a friend. It's going to be a good time. There's going to be good food. You don't have to get in the pool, but you can just stick your feet in if you want to. Um, and if you need the address of where that is, come see me and I'm happy to text that over to you. So this morning we're going to welcome Pastor Matt. Hey everybody. How you doing? Good. Good. I'm doing well, too. Thanks for asking. Appreciate that. <laughs> so today we're in, we're in this uh, series. We've been kind of going through skin deep and time, kind of been talking about stuff that's underneath the surface that, um, that, we've, had to be, that we've had to deal with from time to time. And, um, and although we started this, I started this planning the series one direction, we just felt like it kind of drifted and went a different direction, um, in the, and, uh, which is kind of interesting to me. But um, hopefully it's something that it's something that I'm getting stuff out of. I hope you're getting stuff out of it. Is anybody else enjoying the series you've been in? Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm realizing that my Bible is literally falling apart in pieces. So I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Um, you know, the pastor should have a Bible that's intact. But then if you read it enough, maybe it falls apart. I don't really know. We're going to be in James chapter 4 today. If you do have your Bible with you, you can, you can turn there at, at your convenience. Um, we'll be there in just a few minutes. Um, but today I want to talk about conflict, and I'm going to talk about how sometimes we find ourselves in a place of conflict. In fact, it reminds me of a story that there was a, um, two people in this town that were in, a, in the heat of it. They were, they were fighting it out, major conflict, they couldn't figure it out, they wouldn't even be on talking terms anymore, it was terrible. Someone says, you should go talk to the stage, the town stage, and see what he has to say. So the first one goes and finds the town stage and says, hey, listen, you're super smart and wise. And he lays out his case of why he feels like he's right and the other guy is wrong. And the sage says, you know, I, you're absolutely right. And the guy's like, yeah, yeah. And he leaves. And not too much longer, the second guy comes and approaches the town sage and presents his entire case. And, and the, the, the sage says, you know, you are absolutely right. And he's like, oh, man, he walks away. And his wife says, honey, you can't do that to people. Like, you can't say they're both absolutely right. I mean, you're really going to mess some stuff up, you know. And he's like, honey, you know, you're absolutely right. <laughs> we all have conflict. We all have battles. We all have things that go on inside of our life. But so many times we look at the conflict that's going on around us and even outside of us. And we're so quick to point a finger at the other person, aren't we? We're so quick to point a finger at the circumstances, so quick to point our finger at, well, if this person or that person, if this had happened, if that had happened. But, but today I want to say, let, let's pause that mentality and that thinking for just a minute, because I really think that most of the time when we're battling things on the outside, there's also a battle going on on the inside. And though on the surface things may look good, 
but on the inside, underneath the skin, it goes to a place where you realize that there's a war within. And so we have a war within that's happening inside of ourselves, but, but, but we, we don't want to do it. We don't want to admit it, right? We don't want to say it. We don't want to, because that would be a, a crack in the facade. And, and in our culture, we have to look good on the outside all the time. All the time. So conflict. People get stuck in it all the time. I got conflict. Does anybody here, didn't hear conflict? Show of hands. Two people, five, eight. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. All right. That's good. If you didn't raise your hand, you, I know you have it. People get mad. In fact, wars get waged and people die over conflict because people's feelings get hurt. Somebody said something. Countries go to war, people die, things escalate. There are, in this planet right now, people who have generations of hate for another people group. And they're not even sure why anymore, but they were raised from a child to hate this other people group. If you go to the Middle East, there's conflict in those areas right now that is generation upon generation of, of conflict that's going on. I hate these people because my parents hated them because their parents hated them. Why? Because something happened. But people get in conflict with one another. I don't like conflict. I, I don't like drama. Do you ever hear those people like, oh, I'm, I'm a no drama person. But yet everywhere they go, there's drama. I'm a no-drama person. It's like, well, you know, um, maybe, just maybe, let's look at the common denominator, right? Sometimes there's drama around those people. You see, the biggest war that we fight is the war within. Because that can be raging on the inside. Nobody knows it because it's underneath the surface. And we can walk around with a smile on our face and everything's okay, but on the inside, everything's not okay. And we don't admit it. We don't want to talk about it. But today, guess what? We're going to talk about it because it's underneath the skin. It's underneath the surface. And the biggest war that we're going to face is the war that is within. If you have your Bibles, James chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. James chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. We're going to start in verse 1, and, and I'm just going to kind of read through, and, and we'll see where we go with this. So number, verse number 1, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it the whole army of evil desires at war within you? You, you know, what's interesting is, is what's causing the quarrels and the fights. Well, several versions will actually say it's killing you or you want to kill another person. And, and I can tell you that up till now, um, I have not murdered anybody yet. And, and, and uh, hopefully that doesn't happen in the future, but I've, I've never had a quarrel escalate to a place where I've killed somebody. And I remember reading this at one point in time and, and almost like patting myself on the back, like, you know, I'm not killing anybody. But I did realize this is that um, even though maybe we haven't literally murdered anyone, sometimes our conflicts and what causes our fights and our quarrels um, is, is, is something going on on the, the inside. Verse 2 um, it says, you want what you don't have, and you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous for what others have, and you can't possess it, so you fight and quarrel to take it away from them. And yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. So you want what you don't have, and you scheme and kill to get it. Have you ever been there, or somebody else has something that you want? Joy, peace, maybe a good attitude, maybe a, something else. And, and you think, I, I deserve that too, and I can't get it. And so you end up with, like, inside, you're fighting yourself on the inside, but it comes spilling out of your mouth on the outside. And maybe you didn't literally kill anybody. Congratulations. But have you ever killed somebody's day? Have you ever killed somebody's mood? Have you ever done something where you literally killed somebody's joy? Lashed out at somebody verbally and just, like, wrecked their day? Why? Because you have something on the inside that's not being dealt with and you have projected it onto something on the outside and the quarreling that you see on the outside is really something that's going on on the inside. And we don't have this settled and so it comes out and it dumps out into other people around us. Not 
it's kind of quiet this morning. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Verse 3, let's see. And, and when you ask, and even when you do ask, you don't get it. Because your whole motive is wrong. You want it only for what will give you pleasure. So the quarrels and fights that are among us are coming from the inside of us coming out. And it's not necessarily the outside that's coming in. You picking up where we're, where we're going? And, and so then we, we, we want to fight for it and we want to go for it. But, but anyhow, and we're doing it all wrong. Verse 4, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy this world, you can't be a friend of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the Holy Spirit, whom God has placed within us, jealously longs for us to be faithful? You know, I think that, that there's like a, a tension. Like, like there's a way that the world wants to see things done, and yet there's a way that God says he wants things done. And those two things aren't necessarily congruent all the time. In fact, what we see in our natural eyes is the logical path forward. But there's another way that God says. And God's words, he says that his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. And so if we're doing things God's way, we're going to get God results. But so many times, don't we approach things in a natural way expecting supernatural results? It doesn't really happen like that. If you want supernatural results in your life, you have to apply supernatural ways. Verse 6, and he gave us more and more strength to stand against such evil desires as the scriptures say, God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. God sets himself against the proud. A different translation, he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. When I grew up, that was the verse that I had memorized. But here it says, he sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Grace is, is the word that comes to mind. And, and grace means favor. Grace means unmerited favor. It means getting what you don't deserve or maybe not getting what you do deserve. Grace gives you immunity from things from the past. You see, God sets himself against the proud or resists the proud but I'll tell you this, I think the proud people resist God. Because if you're prideful, you don't need grace. If, if, you're, if, you are, if you're prideful, then, then why would you ever need that? I've done nothing wrong to even be in a place to even want or desire grace. Grace would be useless on me because I've done everything the right way. Pride resists grace. Grace resists pride. There's like oil and water. And, and if you want God's ways and... You've got to do it the way God wants to do it. I, I, I see that God's grace is sufficient to cover everything. You see, God's grace, it abounds, increasing to cover sin. And this idea of humility or being humble, like, like humility isn't the thing where you think low, like lowly of yourself. Some people say humility is when you just don't think of yourself. But, but the reality is, is if you're humble, you at least are honest about yourself. And, and you're aware and you're like, okay, I understand that I have strengths and weaknesses. Humility is saying, yeah, I know that I don't perform at the level that I probably should be performing in this area. I know that I have struggles in this area and that area. Humility is a, a, almost a place of self-awareness where, where you understand your shortcomings. And humility says, yeah, I'm gonna, I understand my where who I am, but I also understand who God is. And, that, and that, that there's a gap that has to be bridged between the two. So verse number seven. So humble yourselves before God. Well, the first six verses, verses are talking about we have a conflict, and this conflict is happening on the outside, but really it's coming from the inside. Verse seven is the solution. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw close to God, and God will draw close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. 
Uh Uh-oh, it's turning dark. Verse 9, let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. When you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on him, he will lift you up and give you honor. Hmm. Sometimes we need to recognize when we've fallen short. Sometimes we need to understand that the conflict that we've been facing out in the world is oftentimes a conflict that's on the inside. And the conflict that's on the inside, we want to fix it with our natural path, but I think God is saying, no, there's a spiritual healing that needs to happen in the midst of that in order to resolve the conflict internal before it can go external. So sometimes we need to recognize when we're wrong. Sometimes we need to look in the mirror and understand that although I think I'm fighting with my brother or my sister, my coworker or my boss, my husband or my wife, I think my conflict is with these other people. But I want to challenge you that sometimes you need to look in the mirror and realize that there's actually a conflict on the inside. And, and that's the root of what's coming out of you. We can't just be people who live skin deep and live on the surface God's calling us to live it a higher way and a higher life. And part of that is understanding that our internals need to be dependent on him, regardless of what's going on in our external. You got to look in the mirror and then ask God for help. So, verse 7. That's the answer. So we found the problem. We have conflict. We understand now that it's coming from the inside and working its way outside. But God says, here's how you fix it. And so number one is this. It says, submit to God on the first part of verse 7. It says, submit to God. You see, the world says that when you're having a problem, you should bow up. You should elevate yourself. You should stand taller. When when you're having a problem, your natural position is that you want to assert yourself. You want to promote yourself. You want to... Make your case against the other person so that you put yourself in a higher position so that you can win the fight. And you can win the conflict because you know why? We're all winners and we want to be winners. And I'm going to win this one too. But you can win and lose at the same time. See, the world says that promote yourself and to push yourself and to protect yourself. God says, don't be conformed to this world. Well, that's what the world would do. That's what our natural instinct is. And God is saying, don't. Don't, don't go there, because that's not going to get you the result, and it's not going to be where he wants you to go. If you really want to find peace and joy in the midst of the conflict, you do things God's way, and you're going to get God's solutions. So God says, don't be conformed in this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So, so here's this. This is this, this dichotomy between pride and humility that we're seeing in the scripture here. And, and, and it says this, like, this is what I'm seeing, is that pride is like the beginning of sin because pride is what leads us down the path of sin. So humility is then the beginning of healing, of the path of healing. So pride goes before a fall and humility is then going to go towards restoration. Pride will take you down this place where your conflict will become escalated. Things will be said that you can't take back. Wounds will happen in the midst of the pride. But if you're humble, all of a sudden you're saying, no, I need help. And you turn to God, now all of a sudden you have God on your side and you have a supernatural force that is helping in the midst of this. Humility is the beginning of salvation. Because if you're humble, you can receive grace. And if you don't receive grace, you're not going to find what you're looking for. You'll live in a place of conflict, internal and external. Number two, right in verse seven, it says, humble yourselves. And then it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. My conflict has nothing to do with the devil, or does it? So many times, I'm so guilty of this, and so maybe you can relate. I won't say you, I'll say me. But so many times, I will look at a natural conflict and feel like it's a natural problem that needs a natural solution. 
But I want to tell you there's a spiritual war that's going on beneath the surface. And so many times the natural conflict we see is actually coming from a place of spiritual unrest. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, yeah, because I'm fighting with my mother-in-law and she's the devil. That makes sense. I'm kidding. My mother-in-law is amazing, just for the record. So how do you resist? Because if you resist with pride, then aren't you going to fall right back into it? No, you resist with humility. Because that opens up the door for grace. You resist with humility. With humility, Recognize that you can't do it alone. What got you into this mess was doing it alone. It's not going to get you out of this mess. So you resist with humility and you can resist with confidence. Humility and confidence are not opposites. Humility is the honest evaluation of yourself and knowing where your actual weaknesses are and acknowledging those. Confidence is saying, I know, here's what I know, my weakness is this, but I'm going to stand in a place of humility, allowing grace to come into my life and allowing me to stand in confidence, not because of my strength, but because of his strength. And so when you're standing in the strength of the Lord, and you're standing in the strength of God, in the midst of your conflict, in the midst of the unrest that's going on inside of you, and the unrest internal has been causing the unrest on the outside, and you've got all this angst that's going on, when you finally stop and you put yourself in a place of humility, you allow the grace of God to come into your heart and into your soul, you can now stand with confidence and say, I am going to resist the enemy, because, not because of how good I am, but because of how good God is. So my humility in myself, a confidence... In my God. And number three is this. It says, draw near to God. So verse seven says, humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse eight says, draw close to God, and God will draw close to you. God will draw close to you. When we draw close to God, he will draw close to us. How do we do that? And and shouldn't like, shouldn't it be like on God to come to us first? I mean, he kind of did, to be fair. He sent Jesus from heaven to earth, died on the cross, paid the price for our sin. He's absolutely made the first step and reached his hand out. But there is a responsibility on each and every one of us to reach our hand back. He's offering grace. He's offering his mercy. But there's a step that we have to take to say yes to God and accept it and internalize it. That's the step of drawing close to God. So what does that look like? Well, I, w- I would say, first of all, we do that publicly. In fact, that's what we're doing this morning. If you're here this morning, you have made an effort to draw close to, to God. How do you do that? Well, publicly, this is what we're doing. You literally got out of bed, even though you maybe didn't want to. It was the nice weather out, and I wanted to go hang out in my backyard. I got projects that have to be done around the house. Those seem pretty important. But what did I do? No, no, no. We got up, and we came to church. Why? Because we wanted to worship together as a congregation. We want to study God's word together as a, as a congregation. We want, to, we want to gather in this place. Why? Because we're publicly making a physical move and, a, and publicly putting ourselves in a position that we want to draw close to God. That's what this is. That's why when you have small groups and you have other gatherings inside of the church or throughout the week, they're so important. It's because you're making a public declaration. You're making a public position. You're putting your feet into motion and putting yourself in a place where you're now saying, I am, I am putting myself in a place intentionally to try to draw close to God. And if we're drawing close to God, it says he will draw close to us. If the band would come, I'm actually going to wrap up. So we draw close to God publicly, but we also draw close to God privately. So what does that look like? Well, I I think that there is a point where drawing close to God privately probably looks like, like a daily quiet time. Maybe finding time in your day and in your life and in your week to really focus and meditate and pray. What is the activity... 
that draws you closer to God? What, what, what's the thing that you do that you feel more connected to God? For some people, it's hiking in nature, and they feel so connected to God. And, and they, they can witness the, 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 the miracle of, of, of his creation. And so they can walk in nature and, and, and they find themselves not even trying, but they find themselves praying and, and, and almost like in tune with the Spirit of God in a way that it just resonates inside. For others, they're like, I don't want to hike in a mountain. My feet hurt. That sounds terrible. So what is it for you? Is it maybe listening to worship music? Maybe you need to put some music on. What is it that you find that really draws you close to him? So I think that we have to have public things, but there needs to be a private side of it as well. Go find that thing. That's my challenge for you this week. Go find that thing that draws you close to God and go do that more. Put yourself in a place where you're drawing closer to him. And for some people, it's reading the Bible. For some people, it's praying. For some people, it's listening to worship. For some people, it's being in nature. For some people, it's find that thing that resonates with you and do it. Draw close to him publicly. Draw close to him privately. You see, in trying to sort out the conflict that is out there around us, I believe the Bible, like it, it starts with the conflict within us. And if we can settle the conflict in us, it works out and settles the conflict around us. So find the ways that you need to do that. See, the war within is what we're all battling. And if pride is the cause, then humility is the answer. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. There was this dad who had a small child, and he um, he uh, he wanted to kind of distract him for a few minutes. He just needed a few minutes of alone time, and so he thought, "I'm going to make a puzzle for him real quick." And so he did. He got like a piece of paper, and he found like this really is a, is a coloring book, and he cut a page out of the coloring book, and um, and he said, "Look, here's this complex picture. I want you to. I'm going to make a puzzle." So he takes it right, and he says, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to just we're going to rip it here." And, and I'm going to make like a little puzzle. And so he, he like tears it all up into pieces. And, 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 um, and he's like, you know, and a bunch of pieces. I'm not going to do a bunch today. And he says, here you go. And so he like puts it on the table. And the kid's like, awesome, I'm going to do a puzzle. And dad's like, great, I can go get five minutes a piece and quiet. Maybe, maybe 30 minutes because I tore it up so well. And, and so the kid is, is like now like starting to work on his puzzle. And, um, and, and it's really complex piece. And, and he's trying to sort it all out. And... Um, and, and so, you know, he's, he's like trying to figure it out. So he's got some tape and he's like putting it together. And, um, and, and so we're going we're gonna to see if I can fix this thing really quick. And so the, the dad is like, he's gone for a few minutes. Um, but then he, uh, when, when he comes back, he's like, the, the son has it fixed in like a minute, you know. And, um, and he's like, wow, how did you get that fixed so fast? And uh, the son was like, well, it was easy, Dad. I know that that picture was so complicated. And, and this is taking longer than I thought. And he fixes it. And so he, he says, see, see, look, I put it back together. And, and, and the dad was like, how would you do that? And he says, well, Dad, because you tore it out of the coloring book. On the other side of the paper was actually a simpler picture of a man. When your world feels like it's falling apart and it's complicated and you're like, how am I going to put the pieces back together? When you focus on the inside, everything on the outside starts to come together too. Will you stand with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we know that we're living in a world right now that is complicated. And God, as, as we have conflict and things in our life, God, as we have stuff that is, is the war that's raging around us and even raging within us. God, allow us to have your peace and your calm and your joy and your confidence. God, we, we need that. So God, today we just say, we humble ourselves before you and say, I, 
I don't have what it's going to take. But God, I know that you do. And so I'm turning to you, Heavenly Father. In, my, in our humility, we say, I'm broken. In my humility, I say, I don't have it. But in confidence, I can stand and say, God, you do have it. And so God, I turn my life over to you. I put myself in a place, God, where I lay myself at your feet and say, God, will you help me put me together? And can I stand in your confidence? And will your grace come into my life? And will you come and fix the mess that's going on? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. sing. 